So this morning we're looking at the church in Sardis, Revelation chapter 3. And we're looking at chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 6. And this is to the church in Sardis. And um, as you remember, we've this sort of Revelation series, if you like, we started at the, the, in chapter 1 and worked our way through four of the seven churches so far, starting with Ephesus, which was the apostolic church uh, from the years AD 30 to 100. Smyrna, if you remember, represented the persecuted church, and that was roughly the years 100 to 313. Uh, Pergamum uh, was the state church when um, the, the persecution stopped and Christianity was sort of embraced as the state religion. And that was 313 to 590. And Thyatira represented the papal uh, system or Roman Catholicism. And that was 590 to 1517. And now we're up to the Sardis Church or the Reformed Church. And I'm sure uh, many of you um, will have heard of the Reformation. This is from the years 1517 uh, up to 1730. So we're rapidly approaching uh, present day as we've been working our way through church history uh, with these churches. And the passage starts in verse 1, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And as you know from the last few churches, I'd like to give you a bit of context, a bit of history about this church, uh, just to, uh, to, to warm us up, if you like, and to, to start off. Well, uh, Sardis, his, according to history and according to geography, uh, was built around the year 500, give or take, a few years and it was situated on a narrow plateau 1500 feet above sea level in other words it was pretty high you know this is a, a high place it was built in a mountainous region and it had strong high walls sardis was a fortress it was a natural uh, stronghold or place of protection situated in um Modern day Turkey, if you like, well, it wouldn't be modern day uh, now, it was a Lydian Empire, the capital city of the Lydian Empire, which was an important part of the Roman Empire. And Sardis boasted fame for its abilities in art and in craft, and it was uh, known, it had a reputation for uh, its lavish use of brightly coloured and precious stones. Rightly called a precious stone. We saw a stone actually um, in, in one of the other churches. Uh, we we're given a white stone, a uh, Pergamum that was. In fact, you may have heard um, King Croesus, and he had um, um, sort of mythological status. Sardis was so wealthy uh, that we have the, the myth of King Croesus, the person. Um, who he gained his wealth in the sands of the river Pactolus, apparently, after the legendary king Midas, who everything he touched turned to gold, according to uh, the story, the Midas touch. And uh, according to mythology, if I'm remembering right, he even touched his daughter and she turned to gold and he was horrified. And uh, so he washed his hands in the river and in, and Sardis found all his gold in that river, apparently. It's, uh, it's, is of course a mythology, although there is some truth that this was a wealthy, wealthy place. It was a strong place, it was a powerful place, secure with its high walls. Um, and the, the Lydians, which are uh, Turkey, Sardis of course being the capital, uh, they, according to history, were the first people who started to mint uh, coins of gold and silver. Of course, we had coins before, but, but they weren't gold or, or silver, they were just metals or whatever. Uh, but Sadi started to mint coins with gold and silver. And um, in fact, they were so wealthy that an earthquake destroyed the, the place in, and uh, much of the places around it in AD 17. And um, th they were able to rebuild it. I think the Emperor Tiberius offered to, to pay for it, and uh, the, the people in charge of Sardis didn't even need the support, they just 
paid for the whole city to be, uh, to be rebuilt. Sardis is typical um, of a church or a person who trusts in their own strength, who trusts in their own wealth, who trusts in their own accomplishments rather than trusting in or trusting on God. And that's what we can learn uh, from Sardis. Not to trust yourself, to trust God. And you'll notice the way uh, this letter is introduced, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And if you follow and if you remember the other churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, we, we had a, a different way of describing God at the start of each letter. Um, <clears throat> Where am I up to here? It, yes, so it opens with Jesus as the author, and we have some intense figurative language um, here that the person who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars now to the church of Ephesus. Christ was the one who held the seven stars and he walked in the midst of the seven lampstands. And that told Ephesus, a church who was zealous, who was very new to, to Christianity and, and what it means, it told them Jesus was the high priest. And he would walk among the churches. When did he gather in the church? He's there. He curs for you as your high priest. To Smyrna, Jesus was the one who became dead and lived again, revealing that this suffering church, okay, they would die, but Christ died. He shares in their death, and Christ rose again, and they will be brought to new life, and they'll have everlasting life with Jesus. To Pergamos, uh, Christ was the one who has the sharp, two-edged sword. Now this church it was de degrading rapidly, it was sort of losing its way, uh, and they're told by Jesus, I'm the one who judges. I am the one who is, is actually checking up what you're teaching in your church, what you're saying, and, um, and it better be right. Um, <clears throat> With Thyatira, we see similar uh, idea. Jesus, the one with eyes like flaming fire, feet like shining bronze, and again, ready to search, ready to judge her. But to Sardis, Jesus was the one who has the seven spirits and the seven stars. And this would represent a, a sevenfold intensified spirit of, of God. You'll find... Um, in, in verse 2, we, we said, wake up, you know, Sardis is the, the reputation of being alive, uh, but, but it's, it's not, it, it's told to, to wake up. And in fact, uh, just as we saw in Pergamon, where Constantine uh, embraced Christianity as the state religion, uh, and that had the advantages that, you know, if Christianity was encouraged, but it had the disadvantages that people thought they were Christian just because they were growing up in that place. You know, and you, just uh, what, one of the videos in the Alpha course, it says, you know, you're, that, that's just like saying you're a hamburger because you're in McDonald's. It's daft, it's silly. Um, you're not a Christian if you're brought up in a Christian country. You're a Christian if you've accepted God and if you walk with him, if you've given your life to him. And some of the people in Sardis um, had strong, powerful reputations. But God says, I know your works, but you've got a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. And he says, wake up to this church. And Sardis must wake up. They've got a reputation of being alive, but they're dead. And in fact, this is a reference which would have been all too familiar to the people in Sardis. Because history teaches that Sardis was actually captured twice. It was invaded twice, defeated twice. And if you remember, this was 1,500 feet up, uh, above sea level in the mountains. They had strong towers, and they had watchmen. And they would watch for the enemy. And of course, if they see the enemy approaching, they would uh, alert everyone. They would uh, trigger or sound the alarms and do whatever they needed to do and get Sardis ready to uh, defend itself. But if you, if you know history about Sardis, you know why they were captured twice. The watchman fell asleep. Not just once, but on two occasions, the watchman on the walls of Sardis fell asleep. And that's why they were captured. And Jesus says here to them, as a church, 
And as Christians, don't fall asleep. You've got to wake up. You've got a reputation of being alive, but you're asleep. Wake up. And maybe watching uh, the funeral yesterday and with um, uh, the preacher, I can't remember his name, and he would send people to sleep. They need to wake up as well. He was so dreary, um, unfortunately. <clears throat> so what can cause a church, despite having a reputation perhaps of being alive, but actually um, it says in verse 1, You've got a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. What can cause the church to be dead, or a church to die? Well, if you think of it, what, what causes a body to die? A body dies, or we die, when, when, when your spirit leaves it, when, when everything stops. You know, our heart stops to beat, and nerves stop moving, our blood stops pumping, and our spirit leaves our body. This is just a shell, really. And similarly, uh, with churches, they, they die when the spirit leaves the church, when they're not preaching the word, when they're not worshipping in spirit and in truth, as it says in John. Sin, disobedience, unbelief, compromise kill a church. Churches can look good from the outside, like Ephesus. They can be full of zeal and good work, and amazing acts in the community. But if they're not preaching the word of God, if the spirit isn't present in that church, they're dead. They're dead. And I think we see that a lot today with churches. A lot of them, there's no life in the churches. They've got an amazing band, a slick image, a, a beautiful, impressive building. Like, like uh, yesterday, I would tell you, what an amazing uh, piece of architecture. I've never been to that church, so it would be unfair to, be com to comment. But from what I saw yesterday, didn't seem alive to me. <clears throat> Even individuals have to be careful for this. The late Rabbi Zacharias, a world leading apologist, he had a stellar reputation. He wrote um, books which were, were, were best selling books, uh, read by hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, of followers across the world. But recently, it, it looks to be proven that he was a predator, an abuser as well. A wolf in sheep's clothing. And how would this begin? Well, it begins with small sins, I would suggest, in Genesis 4 7. Just before Cain murdered his brother Abel, um, God said to him, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. Sin begins small, it crouches. I spoke on this a few years ago. It crouches and you've got to deal with it before it grows. And you've got to make sure that you're woke. You're not woke in the modern sense, but that you're awake. You know, you're, uh, you're uh, alive and uh, you're, you're aware of what's going on. And nations must even be wary. Jeremiah 9.3 says, They bend the tongue like a bow. Falsehood, not truth, has grown strong in the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. And today, in this nation and other nations, falsehoods have indeed grown strong. Our leaders and media propagate lies every day. But we shouldn't live by lies. We need to live, for, uh, live by and stand for truth. So here we see Jesus command Sardis to wake up and to strengthen what remains. Verse 2 and 3. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. And it's true that Sardis is either dead in the sense that there are non-Christians in the church and, and very, very few Christians, or it's in such sp uh, poor spiritual condition that it's about to die, it's on the verge of death. While that is true, they're not beyond Christ's powers to summon and wake up. And, and I remember, and I hope I'm remembering this right, Lazarus, I think it was, and Jesus said, uh, woke him up. He said, you know, come forth, come up, wake up. And um, 
Now, I may be confusing him with the little girl, um, and he said, have something to eat. I think it was the girl he said that to. Give, have something to eat. Must have been exhausted <laughs> being dead. <laughs> but uh, have something to eat. I always remember that. Um, Jesus uses the frequent uh, New Testament simile like a thief. Uh, and we see this often in the New Testament. Like a thief. Um, coming like a thief. And... Um, this, this doesn't mean that thievery is good or anything to associate, of course, with, with Christ. That's a, uh, and it sounds stupid for me to say, but a, a pastor once um, sort of made a, a comparison in that sense, which is just crazy. Um, it, it means just like a thief comes at a time when you don't expect, he's coming back for his church at a time when you don't expect. So don't fall asleep on your watch like the watchman at Sardis. You've got to wake up. And if you need to, just like it, it, late, late at night, perhaps when you're getting ready for bed and maybe you're drifting off in front of the telly, or, or maybe you're trying to do some work and, and you're falling asleep, you might need to, to make yourself a drink and you might need to move about. Maybe as Christians you need to stretch your legs. Maybe you need to do something um, to serve. Maybe you need to, to, to get involved and read your Bible more and spend more time feeding off the Word. But you've got to do something to make yourself wake up. Don't fall asleep. And Jesus is coming soon. And every time, well not every time, but a lot of times when people say oh, Jesus is coming soon, sometimes we can have a reaction to say, well, the Apostle Paul thought he was coming in his lifetime. And for hundreds and thousands of years, oh, everyone has thought Jesus would come in their lifetime. And true, they, they were wrong. He, he hasn't come back yet. But logically, we are closer now than anyone in history has ever been. And if Paul thought he was coming soon, he must be coming soon for us. You know, any day now. And, and so I, I'm racing against time. Can I have the opportunity to speak about the rapture before we're raptured? So that's the, uh, that is the challenge, as we're going quite slowly uh, through Revelation. Um, verse 4. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, People who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, okay, this church is about to die, or, or, it, or it is dead. Uh, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. But there were still some Christians in that church. There were still some people who hadn't uh, soiled their garments, who will walk with Jesus in white. And that should be an encouragement to us also. I mean, sometimes we're, we're looking at the state of the country and we're, we're thinking, what a mess, what is going on? Is there any hope left? And of course there is hope. Jesus is our hope and he's coming back. But be encouraged. There are still Christians in this country. There are still Christians in Birmingham. And um, there are still other churches uh, which are, are doing well and are good as well. Uh, so be encouraged, don't be discouraged. But at the same time, uh, do, don't be overly concerned with any material things or any sort of possessions or, or become too focused on this life. Um, don't sort of think, oh, it's all going wrong, it's all going wrong. Don't focus too much on this life. Keep your eyes on the kingdom of God, eyes on the kingdom. We're just passing through here, we're just visitors on this earth, and one day we'll be uh, with Christ uh, in eternity, um, if you've given your life to him. Verses 5 and 6. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This letter to Sardis is, is the shortest of the letters. And uh, I can't believe I'm up to the final two verses already, actually. I feel like I've only been talking for five minutes. Maybe, uh, maybe it feels different when you're listening. Um, but these final two verses do uh, cause us to ponder some interesting things. Uh, and firstly, what is meant by the one who conquers? The one who conquers. Well, as Christians... When you're a Christian, you are a conqueror through Christ. Jesus conquered over sin and over death 
through his death on the cross and resurrection to life. And when we clothe ourselves in his righteousness, we become conquerors by the power of Christ. And we too will be resurrected to life. So what is it to be a conqueror? To be a Christian. What is it to be a conqueror? To be a child of God. If you give your life to Christ, you are a conqueror. You will conquer if you are a Christian. And then we have the book of life, or the Lamb's book of life. And this simply, we can, it can be quite confusing and we can sort of think one thing and another thing, but simply this is a record of all the people who have accepted Christ, who will spend eternity with him. Well, why is it called the Lamb's book of life? Because Jesus, the Lamb, purchased believers on the cross. It's his book, but it's not written for God. And God is omniscient. He knows everything. God doesn't need a book to, to, to know whose names are in it. He just knows. He doesn't need to think, oh, I wonder whose name is in that. He knows. He knows. So he's written as an encouragement for believers. Now, it's true. There's an interesting verse in Revelation 13, 8, in reference to people worshipping the beast. And who knows when I might have, uh, have time to talk about the beast. And that says, all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now this tells us that the book of life was written, names were written in the book of life before the earth was made. But how? Well, God, being outside of time and all-knowing, has already seen who will freely choose uh, to accept his gift of salvation and who will live for him. So according to his foreknowledge, he knows at the end of your life, you will have uh, been a Christian, you will have believed in me, your name will be in the book of life if you accept him. So he's not forcing anyone to choose him, he's just, he knows what the outcome will be and he wrote, wrote his book before the earth. That's how, all that is. Just like if I watch Match of the Day, even though the result has already happened, at, say three o'clock on a Saturday, and I'm watching 10 o'clock at night, um, I might know the score and I'm watching the match. Now I'm not forcing Rashford to score a goal or anything like that just because I know what will happen when he takes the penalty. It's up to him. It's how he takes the penalty. It's how he kicks the ball. And God knows what will happen because he's outside of time. It's still your choice. You have to accept God and accept him today. <clears throat> so verses 5 and 6 close the letter of Sardis with a lovely promise for the true believer. If you have truly accepted Christ and if you choose to live for him, then you will be clothed in white garments and you have the encouragement of your name being written in the Lamb's Book of Life and the promise of everlasting life with Jesus. How wonderful is that? And I want to, uh, to, to sort of end on a point. Um, you may be thinking, but how do I get my name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Um, you're saying, you know, this says, who's a believer? How do I make that free choice you spoke about? How do I um, get my name there? Well, 2 Peter 1.10 instructs us to make our calling and election sure. This is something that you need to take very, very seriously. We don't know when we're going to die. COVID has taught us that anything can happen, our world can change, you know, just in a moment's notice. And it's impacted every one of us in every aspect of life. You might live for another 20 years, 50 years, you might live just for another day, we don't know. You need to make your calling and election sure. And God wants you to accept him. He wants you to know him. 1 Timothy 2.4 tells us that. And he wants everyone to have the opportunity to accept him. And there's a lovely verse in Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verses 13 and 14. And he says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He's preaching for me. 
So God knows. How lovely is that? He knows our frame. He remembers that we are only dust. And you might think, Mark, you don't know what I've done. I've done terrible things. I've made terrible mistakes. I've done this and I've done that. How can God uh, want me in his book of life? How? Well, if you fear him, if you give your life to him, he has compassion on you. Psalm 103 uh, tells us that. He remembers that we're just dust. He remembers what he created us from. Um, and also, he loves you so much that he, he proved it. He went to the cross, taking on our uh, sins on that cross. He lived a perfect life. Um, as Jesus, uh, Jesus came, came. He didn't see equality with God, though he was equal with Him. He didn't see it as something to be grasped. He left his divine nature aside. In one sense, he left the heavenly realms. He came to earth to live as a man, to show us how to live. And he healed people, and he taught people, and he performed amazing signs, showing that he is God. And he did this not just to get a kick of what it what, what, what it's like to live on earth. He did this because loved you so much and our sin separates us from God but there's a way to be made right with him there's a way to uh, to get your name in that book of life and that is through what happened on the cross there was no forgiveness without uh, the shedding of, of blood well in history the Israelites used to sacrifice animals um, but an animal can't pay for a human sin and they'd have to do it again and again and again but Jesus uh, God, God sacrificed himself once and for all on that cross. And he, he rose again after three days, proving that he's God, conquering death. And if you accept that gift of salvation, if you say you're sorry for what you've done, then you can be saved. So how can you make sure? One, believe. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, two, confess. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's got God's promise on that. And the amazing thing, or one of the infinitely amazing things about God, he never breaks a promise. His promises are lasting and they're safe you can go to the bank with that promise um, it's, it's never um, never going to be broken in fact I was watching something this morning uh, about Israel and God promised Israel that he, he would bring the Jews back to the land and, he, and the land would be, be prosperous again and it would recover and today after all those years we see Israel it's one of the top eight most powerful nations in the whole world and it's, it's remarkable the technology it's got and uh, the, the agriculture and, and all sorts of things. Um, never, never doubt that God will keep his promise. Uh, three, repent. Luke 13, 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So this means to turn your back on the former ways, to stop living the, the way that God says is, is wrong and not to do, uh, but to, to start to live for God instead. To start to put your old self uh, as if it was crucified with Christ on the cross and to clothe yourself with Christ's righteousness. Uh, four, accept the gift of salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, this is the gift of God. And the example I, I used before was a check or a present. Uh, at Christmas, someone gives you a present, uh, maybe it's in the box and it's wrapped up and you've got it. If you don't open it, if you don't take it out, out of the box, it's worthless. If you don't go to the bank and, and, and cash in your check, what's the point? You've got to accept that gift of God. You've got to accept that salvation. And finally, five, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to wash and regenerate you. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us, not because of our works, done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So allow God to work in you. Allow God to shape you. Allow God to take